From a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux. My country isn't a nation. I hope everyone will forgive me taking this week to break from our normal diet of history and pop culture. Though we are discussing a key historical concept here, it is me, after all. But it is the July 4th weekend, and I have been meaning to treat this topic for a while now. I must further beg the indulgence, of course, of all of you international readers, for I am about to, in the proper tradition of my country, go on at some length about my country. I have at times noted that I chafe at the use of the word nation, or worse yet, nation-state, to describe my country, the United States of America. And that distinction has come up more than once in the comments, with requests for more to elaborate. So, let's talk about it. What is a nation, and why isn't the United States one? But before we dive in, as always, if you like what you are reading here, please share it. If you want updates whenever a new post appears, you can click below for email updates, or follow me on Twitter, at Brett Devereaux, for updates as to new posts, as well as my occasional ancient history, foreign policy, or military history musings. Finally, if you really like it, you can support my writing on Patreon. Image. Fourth of July, fireworks display. Image description. In case anyone was unclear which country I was talking about. End of image description. Nationless states. First, we ought to note at the outset that it is not a new thing to describe the United States as a nation, at least in very general terms. No less authority than George Washington did so in his addresses to Congress and his farewell address, though in reading, Washington's use of the term doesn't quite map onto its modern meaning. He tends to use nation when he wants to stress the constructed unity of the country, as in the farewell address, the various parts of the country being, quote, directed by an indissoluble community of interest as one nation, end quote. Despite the fact that he had spent an entire paragraph noting regional differences significant enough that by the technical definition of nation, they ought to disqualify the young republic. Of course, the United States has all sorts of national things, museums, parks, cemeteries, debt, etc. And this sort of usage, where nation is really a metonymy for a citizen body and the state that serves them, is well enough so far as it goes, so long as we understand the degree of imprecision. The problem is when that metonymy, which is using one word in place of another related word, like saying one owns wheels instead of an automobile, is mistaken for true, narrow, literal, or technical meaning, as if someone thought that putting boots on the ground meant that we need only drop some footwear out of a helicopter to solve a problem. One sees this all the time, where arguments begin from the proposition that there is an identifiable American nation, often with an identifiable people, that excludes quite a number of American citizens. Or that the United States is a nation in a narrow sense, rather than some other thing, like an ideology. And the error here is simple. By the narrow technical definition, the United States is not, and has never been, a nation, and is unlikely to become one in the near future. Here, it is necessary to clarify that nation doesn't just mean country or state. After all, there are quite a lot of different kinds of states and countries, and only some of them are nations, or nation-states, which is when the nation and the state are co-extensive. A country is a territory in its associated polity. Some countries are not states at all. Wales, for instance, is a country within the multinational state of the United Kingdom. And, while most of the world is divided up into states now, it was not always so. Mongolia was a country long before it was a state, for instance. 
There are, after all, quite a lot of historical polities which were not states. And states come in different forms too. Quite a lot of post-colonial states, once one gets into it, are actually composite multinational states, functionally masquerading as nation states. This, I suspect, is one reason they tend to be so fragile. The notional form of the state doesn't match its actual foundation. There are still several very clearly imperial states on Earth as well. One may argue the United States is an empire in the technical sense, though large parts of that argument hinge on either substantially redefining empire or focusing the argument on Puerto Rico, Guam, and American Samoa. But there are also traditional, unambiguous, old-fashioned empires still. Several European states still hold vestiges of their old empires. Russia still controls 22 constituent republics, reflecting areas of non-Russian settlement with functionally no autonomy, making it quite clearly an empire under the traditional definition. And of course, the People's Republic of China also meets that traditional definition. Its three largest autonomous regions, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Inner Mongolia, being fairly obvious imperial possessions which are both ethnically different from the PRC itself, which openly presents itself as the Han Chinese national state, and also quite brutally subjugated by that state. Collectively, those regions make up more than a third of the land area of the state. China may thus be a nation, but the People's Republic of China is not a nation state. It is an empire. Since I have opened this can of worms, and we are talking about the United States, I would argue that the better term for the United States global network of bases, economic arrangements, and alliances is hegemony rather than empire as a purely descriptive matter. Empire, as a technical term, is a system of direct territorial control. Not for nothing does the term come from Latin imperium, meaning command. The American system, which aims to achieve the same sort of influence without direct territorial control, is something new and properly ought to be recognized as such. Of course, new doesn't necessarily mean good, but that's an argument for another time. The rather unusual modern configuration of states, I think, fools a lot of people into imagining that the nation and its political expression, the nation state, are the normal way that humans organize themselves. Or alternately, that the nation state is the ideal state. The nation state, we should clarify, is sometimes framed as what you get when a nation acquires statehood. But quite a number of current nation states are dictatorships run by individuals for their own benefit and the benefit of their cronies. And historically speaking, many, potentially most, nation states emerged as a product of power consolidation by the state rather than as an expression of the will of the people. So the more limited a nation state is when the boundaries of the nation and the state mostly coincide, will have to do. And since most of the world's states right now are nation states, or at least try to present themselves as such, many people are quick to assume that the nation state is normal or even the correct form of state. Other forms of state are often presented as archaic holdovers from an earlier age. So, what makes a nation? Well, nation is one of those words with a long history and many definitions, some of which are like the metonymy we discussed, rhetorical fudges on the core definition. The root of the word is the Latin natio. It had the narrow meaning of one's birth. Thus, for instance, Claudia Severa inviting her friend to come, quote, ad diem solemnum natalem meum, end quote, or, quote, to my birthday party, end quote. Natalem here, being a form of natalis, the adjective form of natio. That letter, by the way, is fascinating. 
not only for the look into everyday life, but it is also the oldest confirmed example where we can know, and not just guess, of a woman's own handwriting in Latin, and perhaps in any language. But even during antiquity, a natio could also mean a common birth, and thus come to mean a breed or species of something, and thus a tribe, race, or people. From there, the word entered French as nation, meaning birth or place of origin, and from there into English. The definition has changed little, as the fact that classical Latin remained a core part of the education of elites in both the Francophone and Anglophone worlds, meant that the meaning of an obvious Latin loan word, like nation, could never drift very far from its original roots. After all, until quite recently, elite users of the word were likely to be continually exposed to it in its original Latin context, where it meant birth and from there a group of people united by a common birth or origin. Latin's other word for a common descent group, gens, has similar connections, being linked in its origin to gigno, to give birth. Thus, for instance, Venus genetrix, Venus the birth mother. The usages actually blend further, much like nationes, the plural of natio, could mean, in essence, all of the peoples. Gentes, the plural of gens, could do the same. Thus, for instance, the Roman ius gentium, often translated as the law of nations or law of peoples, was the law in Rome as applied to all individuals equally, regardless of citizenship or origin, distinct from the ius civilis, civil law, which applied to citizens only. Consequently, the idea of the nation has always been fixed around the notion of a common birth, or more correctly, the myth of common birth. There are other elements in defining a nation, of course. The group typically needs to be large, inhabit a shared, recognizable territory, and share common elements of culture, especially language, and a common history. But it is no accident that the common birth, the natio of nation, is central. A nation, precisely because it is supposed to share a common culture and history, is an entity that is imagined to extend both into the past and into the future, recreating itself generation to generation. It is through the common birth that the common culture and history are supposedly shared. After all, a common history assumes some commonality stretching back to a prior generation. Now, we ought to be clear here that we are stressing the word myth in myth of common origin quite strongly. As demonstrated by the work of folks like Benedict Anderson, Imagined Communities, 1983, and Azar Ghat, War in Human Civilization, 2006, the nation, in this sense, is not a social or political form that exists in the wild, but is instead a thing that humans can invent, and is usually the product of state building rather than an organic cultural expression. For instance, the uniformity of French is a product of the government in Paris's effort to make it so, not an organic feature of the French people. Nations and nationalism, and especially nation-states, are relatively recent things. We are discussing people who, until quite recently, did not see themselves as having a common origin or destiny and who now claim their ancestors to have been of common stock, typically in contradiction to the views of those very ancestors. Often, national myths will paper over this, with a myth that the nation was once, in the distant past, a single tribe or polity, which expanded, splintered, and must now be reunited. You will recall that notion showing up in the Fremen Mirage. But of course, Polities in the deep past were generally smaller and more fragmented. Such myths rarely pan out. None of which is to say that the nation-state is an invalid form of polity. Merely that we should not imagine it is the only valid kind of polity, or that it is somehow more grounded and organic or less artificial than other polities. Like most polities, 
The nation state is fundamentally built on a fiction. As an aside, the traditional view of historians has generally been that nationalism, the ideology, and the nation itself are essentially modern phenomena emerging in the 18th century. That position has been challenged with arguments suggesting that various pre-modern polities ought to be understood as nations and even that certain pre-modern rulers harnessed something we might call nationalism in their messaging. For example, a gat, nations, the long history and deep roots of political ethnicity and nationalism, 2012. My impression is that most historians remain profoundly hesitant to retroject the modern concept of a nation, nationalism, and the nation state back before the late 18th century. I share that hesitance, particularly on the question of if that national feeling extended below the elite in these potential pre-modern nations, which I think is essential for the definition. It isn't enough for the French nobility to feel French. The French peasantry must as well. But I am not an expert on these particular societies, and so reserve judgment. More broadly, it seems to me that differences in mass literacy and communications must make pre-modern nations meaningfully different from modern ones. At the same time, it is hard not to notice the formation of mega-ethnic groups, even in the ancient world, and the tendency of our sources to think about them in fairly national terms. Egypt is often offered as the oldest example, and there isn't nothing to that idea. The Un-Nation So, we have our definition of a nation, a people historically connected by geographically coherent territory with a shared language, culture, and myth of common birth origin. The United States obviously fails this definition. It isn't even remotely close. To find a common ancestor or ancestral group, a national natio, that connects even a fairly modest majority of Americans, one would have to go back to Proto-Indo-European speakers living in tribes on the Pontic-Caspian steppe around 5000 BC or so, a place notably neither within the United States nor hearkened back to as a historical homeland by many Americans. Americans would also share that notional origin, if we go by language, with roughly 3.2 billion people, or about half of all humans on the earth, not all of whom, or depending on one's definitions, even most of whom are white, I should note. Such a classification, the United States is an Indo-European speaking country, is true, but only a bit more precise than the United States is a country populated by humans. The descriptive potential here is very limited. National identities are, after all, not merely about inclusion, but also about exclusion. They do not typically overlap. While, as noted above, national myths of common origin generally are myths, in the case of the United States, even the myth-making collapses. Attempting to find a common birth origin for even a slim majority of Americans is a hopeless case. And, as far as I can tell, only occurs to people who think European is an ethnicity, apparently blissfully unaware that Europe is a fairly big place with quite a number of different groups of people. Common history is likewise a dud here, but that may require a bit more explaining. After all, there are certainly a set of historical events related to the American polity itself, the founding, the American Civil War, the World Wars, the Civil Rights Movement, and so on, which form a key pillar of American civics. But these stories are connected to the formation of the key institutions of the state. They are not stories of personal origins. While stories of the American founding tend to focus on the role of English settlers, only about 20% of Americans claim British ancestry, and about half of those hearken back to Irish immigrants 
who arrived well after the founding. Needless to say, the common history may not seem quite so common for those whose ancestors arrived on slave ships or many decades after the founding or the 13.7% of Americans who are foreign-born. Or, of course, those whose ancestors arrived over the Bering Ice Bridge, perhaps 20,000 years ago. For my own part, my ancestors filtered over the Atlantic during the 1800s and early 1900s. To the best of my knowledge, none of my ancestors fought in the Revolution. There has been some frustration with that 20% rough figure above. So let's break it down. The 2015 American Community Survey uses self-reporting. We might quibble with self-reporting if we were trying to actually chart the genetic history of Americans, but we're not. This is about identity. And so self-reporting is actually ideal. The relevant potentially British ancestry reports are Irish, 10.6%, English, 7.8%, American, 7.2%, Scottish, 1.7%, and Scotch-Irish, 1%. While the survey notes that the English Americans were a meaningful undercount, note that the primary cause of this is those individuals reporting as American. So by simply including self-reported Americans, we have recaptured most of that potential undercount. And, because our question is identity, folks who might have English ancestry, but identify as, say, Polish American, are safe to remove from the sample. We can also safely remove almost all people reporting Irish descent. The overwhelming majority of Irish Americans arrived in the 1800s. That leaves us adding English, American, Scottish, Scotch-Irish to get people whose reported identity might cause them to hearken back to ancestors who were present and free at the founding. And we get 17.7%. 7.8 plus 7.2 plus 1.7 plus 1. Having recaptured most of the English ancestry undercount by including everyone identifying as American which in turn also includes a lot of people who don't think their families go back to the founding. Or, with a generous upward rounding, about 20%. So yes, I did in fact account for the undercount of self-reported English Americans. I'd add that the fact that this group can't be meaningfully larger than around 20% is also pretty clear from just working backwards from all the other reported ancestries. By raw numbers, none of these origins has much of a claim to be the main shared history. This is a striking difference between the United States and many, though not all, other countries, which I think isn't much appreciated. There is no core American ethnicity in the sense of raw numbers. This is often obscured because ethnic distinctions, which would be broken out in other countries, are collapsed into larger categories, like white or Hispanic and Latino, in census documents and discussions. But 74.4% of Germans are ethnic Germans. None of the constituent countries of the UK is below 75% of its core ethnic identity. In that context, with the great majority of people having most, or in some cases, all, of their ancestors having lived within the bounds of the modern state for generations, in the case of Germany, typically generations before the formation of that state. There really is a shared history, stretching back quite some distance. By contrast, as noted, Anglo-Americans make up perhaps as much as 18% of Americans. If we add together ancestry responses of English, Scottish, Scotch-Irish, and simply American, which probably captures the lion's share of individuals tracing their families back to free persons present at the founding, and a number of people whose families do not go that far. That's not meaningfully larger than the slice of the country which reports German ancestry, 14.7%, most of whose ancestors arrived between 1850 and 1930. It's also not meaningfully smaller 
than the slice reporting Italian, Irish, and Polish ancestry, collectively around 19%. Groups arriving mostly between 1840 and 1910, but who often face pronounced anti-Catholic bigotry in the predominantly Protestant United States. And those slices aren't very different in size from the 12.4% of Americans who report black African ancestry. Most, though not all, of whose ancestors arrived on slave ships between 1619 and 1860. And that isn't very much larger than the roughly 11% of Americans who report Mexican ancestry. And of course, none of these groups is very much larger or smaller than the roughly 14% of Americans who were born somewhere else, immigrated, and naturalized. I could keep going, but the key thing here is that no group is really large enough to demand that their story be the central core narrative. My ancestors were with the founders has to coexist with my ancestors were held in bondage by the founders has to coexist with my ancestors got here in the 1800s with my ancestors were here before the United States was and were forced in by violence has to coexist with my ancestors got here in the 1900s has to coexist with, hey, I just got here. For many people, they will have several of those stories in their personal ancestry. There is no single dominant American story, but a collection of American stories, none of which can claim primacy because none of them represent even a significant plurality of the population's own personal origins much less a majority. Instead, the core historical narrative that ends up in schools is a civic narrative focused on the evolution of institutions and key moments shaping the modern idea of American citizenship, rather than a national narrative following a specific ethnic group, which is why, despite the United States' relatively recent origin, that civic narrative is generally not stretched very much further into the past than the colonial era. The history is a history of America, not Americans. And territory is also a bust. Of course, the United States now occupies a defined territory, but as noted, very few Americans have a long-standing attachment to this land, stretching into the mists of time. In historical terms, most Americans got here only fairly recently. Moreover, the tale of American expansion is one in which the soil of America was repeatedly notional. The United States was where Americans went. And of course, we must note that the places they went were not empty, but seized violently from the inhabitants. The United States can travel, and indeed has done so. Moreover, ancient claims to the land, either arguments for autochthony or greenfield settlement, for the majority of Americans are simply impossible. We all know darn well that we weren't the first people here, and that the United States does not have the most ancient claim to this land. Most nations claim to occupy a sacred ancestral homeland. The United States is fairly open, if quite conflicted, about the fact that it occupies someone else's sacred ancestral homeland. As a necessary aside, of course there is one group of Americans who can quite correctly claim to have nations of their own. Native Americans. Individual Native American nations check all of the boxes. A historic tie to a territory stretching into the deep past, a myth of common origin, common language, culture, and so on. To speak of Native American nations is thus not empty rhetoric, but simply correct usage of the term. Consequently, almost everything I say about America and the nation needs a caveat that it doesn't necessarily apply to the roughly 1.5% of Americans who are Native Americans, Alaskan Natives, Native Hawaiians, or Pacific Islanders. 
A truly national identity is still an option for those folks, if they want it. If I may go a step further, it is not merely that America happens not to be a nation, but moreover that to be an American is to reject claims of the nation on one's self in favor of association on different terms. This is something that makes the United States different from many, though perhaps not all, other non-nation state polities. Many states which are not non-nations are not because they have some ethnic or national group that lives both on their own traditional land and holding to their own identity, but within the borders of a larger state, either as a subject people, like the Uyghurs, or as a constituent people in a multinational state, like the Scots. They are, in essence, multinational states, with several nations existing either in a state of equality with each other or a state of domination and subjugation. But to be an American means that someone, somewhere in your heritage, likely many someones, broke the chain of connection between you and whatever mythical notional nation you may have otherwise been part of. Mind you, not all Americans' ancestors were given a choice in that rupture. Of course, many Americans may still feel a connection to the old country, wherever that may be, but the vision of shared destiny that in theory unites a nation is shattered by adopting a different land, a different state, and in most cases, a different language and culture, often at considerable personal cost. To be a United States citizen is fundamentally to have abandoned the nation as an organizing principle. The United States is not just not a nation. It is a country that, by its very nature, actively rejects the nation as a form, at least for itself. Again, obligatory caveat that I am not saying nation states are bad. Some of my best friends are nation states. Merely that the United States rejects being one itself. What is the United States? The United States is thus quite an oddity, though again, not necessarily unique, just odd. It is not a nation state, nor is it a multinational state, but rather a denationalized state. It is the un-nation. That is not to say America lacks a culture, as is sometimes oddly asserted. Indeed, it has quite a few with wonderful regional variations, which, unfortunately, includes South Carolinian mustard-based barbecue. But, fortunately, also includes all of the other forms of barbecue. And of course, the mass marketing of culture, and particularly of education, has created a shared national literary entertainment and consumer culture though in many cases these are part of an emerging globalized consumer culture. Instead, with no national core, it is the legally defined identity, citizenship, which forms the core of the United States. In this, the U.S. has something in common with the Romans, whose core identity, as we've been seeing and will continue to see, was heavily dependent on citizenship, as the key identity marker over other ethnic, religious, and cultural signifiers. One may fairly ask why all of this haggling about definitions matters. But this brings us back to the mistake at the beginning, mistaking the metonym of calling the United States a nation for the reality of it, attempting to make policy on the assumption that the United States is a nation begins with a category error. The carpenter does not know that he is sitting in front of a loom. Attempting to whittle the weft will not produce results. Take, for instance, the idea of national unity, a phrase which gets used and in the broad sense is useful, but of course in the narrow sense relies on the same metonym as every use of nation to refer to the United States. 
Consequently, attempting to foster unity through the nation as a concept is a hopeless effort because the unity was never national in a real sense to begin with. After all, what shared history, shared myth of origin will you draw upon that all Americans will find valid and applicable to them? I will leave it to you to spot the politico-historical projects which have foundered on these grounds, but they are many. Because, of course, what you could actually have is civic unity, a different thing with different causes, which connects to the one shared identity, citizenship, rather than a shared past. But an appeal to the nation for unity is always going to leave quite a lot of American citizens, perhaps even most of them, cold. Try calling Americans to war, to fight for the bones of their ancestors, and you see the problem immediately. Whose bones? Which ancestors? Buried where? Different Americans will give you very different answers to those questions. But call Americans to war because your fellow citizens were attacked, and the response is real and emotive. I've always suspected this is the same reason for the particular centrality of the United States founding documents. We do not all have the founding itself in common, but we do have the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights in common because those documents are understood to apply to citizens, regardless of where they fit in one's ancestry and to guide the country as it exists now. This is presumably why the Articles of Confederation, no less historic, do not inspire the same patriotic feelings. Worse yet is the idea that what the United States really needs is a national project, the sort of nation building which transformed the fragmented states of Europe into a series of nation states, to forge a national Blut and Boden, blood and soil, identity out of United States citizens. It cannot be done. One may as well attempt to throw a pot from a bag of granite rocks. The raw material is wrong. Efforts to try to build this kind of national identity run aground on the same problem. Whatever distant common history or myth of common origin one selects as the foundation for this kind of national project inevitably won't be shared or understood in the same way by others, either because their ancestors weren't here for that moment or found themselves on the unpleasant business end of it. This is not to say that Americans are immune to bad ideological projects, or that all national projects are necessarily bad, though some very much are. Merely that the effort to form a nation generally fails because the basic ingredients are wrong. The necessary binding agent has been actively removed, though that hasn't stopped regular efforts to replace it with crude populism and xenophobia. In a way, one may feel pity for the born American, who emotively longs for the comfort of the nation because it is something they cannot have. But then, there ought to be a country for the people who would rather not be in a nation. And here it is. None of which is to say, as I have seen said, that the lack of a national consciousness weakens the United States or represents some sort of flaw or failing. There are many ways to build a people. Nationalism is only one of them, and not necessarily the best. As we've been discussing, by the first century, relatively few Romans could connect to a Roman ethnic or national identity. Livy overflows with alternate Italic identities, rooted in different origins and common to them and not the Romans, histories. On that, see P. Erdkamp, Polybius and Livy on the Allies in the Roman Army, in The Impact of the Roman Army, 200 BC to AD 476. Editors L. de Blois and E. Locasio, 2007. What is clear 
is that by Livy's day, there was a fairly vibrant literature stressing the heroics of allied contingents in the Roman army, distinguished by their then non-Roman identity. And although such narratives may have had at best a thin relationship with actual events, they speak to the alternative identities newly enfranchised Italians might have held to. That disconnect would only grow greater in the centuries to follow as Roman citizenship spread out of Italy and embraced people who truly had no connection to Rome as a place or the Romans as an ethnic group, but rather connected to the Roman polity as a citizen. Common origin wasn't the glue that held the Romans together. Common citizenship was collective belonging to a polity which did not require ancestry or history. As an aside, I suspect this is the reason for another thing Rome and the United States share in common, multiple choice foundation myths. For a Roman, Aeneas, Romulus, T. Tatius, Numa Pompilius, Servius Tullius, and L. Junius Brutus were all options for different sorts of founder figures, accomplishing different sorts of foundations. A Roman who didn't much like the patrician story of Lucretia could emphasize the plebeian story of Virginia to much the same effect. C. Mucius Scavola, a youth, presumably unproperty, given that he is given a land grant, Livy, Book 2, Section 13, and P. Horatius Cople, a patrician, and Cloelia, a patrician woman, provide in rapid series a set of alternative heroes. Pick the one you like. Likewise, Americans have shifted emphasis from one framer, hero, or founder figure to another. The multiplicity of framers makes it fairly easy, for instance, for Adams and Hamiltons to come to more prominence lately as compared to, say, Jefferson and Madison, Lincoln, and Martin Luther King Jr. share the National Mall with George Washington. Pick your monument and the moment of foundation that fills you most with that pride of citizenship. Again, not one common history, but a collection of histories connected to citizenship and the country. Successful efforts to actually unify Americans are thus likely to focus not on national identity, which we do not share, but on citizen identity, which we do, and which lends itself to many other shared things, an attachment to the country's laws and stated principles, the documents which set out those principles, the institutions we maintain together, and on the community of interest that shared ownership of a polity creates. Those unifying projects, in turn, can only succeed to the extent that citizenship really is held in common. It falters when the citizenship of some Americans is or feels only second rate. But citizenship over nationality has its advantages. The nation is an exclusive identity, but citizenship coexists more easily with other identities, a necessary advantage in a country as preposterously diverse as the United States. And the emphasis on the citizen body over the nation is clearly a factor in the United States' exceptional ability to embrace large numbers of immigrants successfully. And so my country isn't a nation, but a collection of citizens drawn from all of the nations, setting aside those national identities a family of choice rather than a family of blood, united by common ideals rather than common soil. We haven't always lived up fully to that high ideal. Sometimes the siren call of the nation has pulled us down away from it. But the ideal and the republic built around it remains. And that is what I will be celebrating come July 4th. This has been a recording from A Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux, recorded by myself, a great divorce for accessibility and sharing purposes.
If you enjoyed this content and wish to engage with it or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original post on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this or any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.